Welcome to this introduction to MLOps. Uh, I think everyone uh, by now should be familiar with the slides, so that's the tell specific or clear. Moving on, uh, the agenda for today would be we'll be talking about why MLOps, what is MLOps, and what are the benefits using it. Here you can trust not exactly as a product. MLOps lifecycle and processes, and I will end up with the demo. So let us begin. Why we are talking about MLOps? Right? So we have been seeing a big hype uh, recent, uh, out, like the big players, tech players, talking about and using and investing on it, right? And everyone is talking about AI and ML suddenly, right? And all of the tools, right? Uh, in the last decade, has disrupted this space, right? Now, even on the tech space, right, replacing some of the workflows are like automation kind of job. So it is important to talk about it from a perspective that do we have a certain process, like we do have a set of process for software development. What ML engineering is like uh, doing into the setting of processes, following a, a process to develop ML features or applications. So. This is one of the reason we are talking about MLOps. So I will also like to highlight few surveys, right? So links are mentioned. This is one of the survey, uh, not so old, but in 2020 done by McKinsey, that uh, what percent of AI ML initiatives projects are, right? And how do like perceive that what is the strategy to build an ML project, right? And get it to successful so if we talk about the particulars right uh, we have standard tools and frameworks right for the development process in place for developing ai models so we see two columns right ai high performers and all other respondents right so ai high performers are the one though, those who have achieved a certain productivity after investing into ai and ml projects right they have developed to a certain degree and they are delivering on it so for all high performers, uh, we see the percentage rate, uh, we can average it out that uh, at least uh, one in two companies are not sure about uh, these processes, right? They do not understand that how frequently the AI models needs to be updated and refresh them on the basis of the clearly defined criteria, right? And also using automated tools to produce and test the AI models uh, this is uh, the percentage is 48 percent, like like one in two. Uh, there is another track AI model performance. And this is more towards the observability. Once you deploy the ML project, right, in the production, we are uh, tracking for the efficiency or accuracy or not. So this this survey right tells that uh, there is just a long way, right, to go to establish it as a practice and start up and delivering results. Similarly, there was other parameter. So this parameter was a model tools and technology. Similarly, there was five others, which I will not include all. So for data, you can see that uh, the same, it average out to like below 50%, right? That any data governance uh, streamlined process is there or not. Uh, any process for labeling AI or training data or not. So we'll see like further down in the presentation that what all different term means uh, in ML engineering, right? And how these uh, processes are impacting the overall goal of like meeting the business objectives using the um, projects. Manish, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, one question. So for example, when we say generate synthetic data to train AI models, and there are insufficient natural data sets, all AI high performers. What 49% means here? Like I'm not able to figure out what okay. this 49% means. So this percentage here is uh, the, 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 this column tells about the uh, number of survey uh, organization, participating organizations, right? So they categorize the organization they are surveying on the basis of two categories. First is all high performers who are uh, meeting their business objectives 
and they have achieved a certain levels where they are making their business decisions on the basis of deployed uh, ai products or ml products right so the percentage of those organization which are adhering to these processes uh, that is the percentage indicating here i hope uh, this sort of uh, out of 100 uh, 100 organizations or people surveyed himanshu 49% are using synthetic data if there is no natural data present that is that is what it says and what all other respond so respondents mean so all other are uh, on the second category where uh, there is no defined like business objectives they have like declared that they are able to meet after they have invested or created the project so this there is the category of other yeah so don't those... understand that there are two categories one is you know like everybody that they surveyed and out of that they created a subgroup called uh, ai high performers which are you know like making further strides into ai so in the bigger set maybe think of it as 16% are using synthetic data uh, in the ai high performance category half of them are using synthetic data if they do not have natural data to work with right but what what doesn't sum up for me is the total survey uh, response so 4160 yeah, doesn't doesn't yeah i think that is me. that is that is beyond the point the, the point is that even in the organizations who are saying that they are ai savvy only 50% of them are doing it with synthetic data i think what he's trying to drive home is that the maturity or the uh, you know like uh, the knowledge or the education about ai and the tools and techniques is pretty limited that is what i can understand from the last two slides yeah perfect point vikas yeah that's what uh, okay this, uh, survey is summarizing right that we are not matured enough uh, even the big players who are high performing right now are two in one who are understanding it correct okay so uh, this is one of the reasons we are talking about ml ops there was another research that putting figures that uh, the scaling putting the ai to scale is, uh, is hard right after being on a pilot right so only even the organization are moving beyond pilots only 13% have rolled out multiple ai applications across numerous teams so those are the percentages who are the successful so these are just a surveys right and highlights to seek attention about uh, we we are having a lot of road ahead to like pave the path of established process to build an ai and ml projects so this was that so now let us get into challenges right what ml engineering is having at the moment so when we talk about an ml uh, project right uh, the team is quite diverse in terms of skill set right uh, some some of the people are very very highly expert on some specific like biochemistry right they are expert and they know that how chemistry works while other people are only be in the computer science and they know the data engineering right so most of the data science team time goes in data wrangling which requires help and collaboration right in case the team is large a lot of duplicate effort is being around cleaning and wrangling and like preparing data for training so even before training when we start this right a lot of uh, brainstorming goes right between teams of like and people of different skill sets and uh, when we put and deploy it and like when the data changes over time right that there is a skewness right, features and we don't know that if it will work with the real time data or not the results are often not shareable right even if people are using and they have established uh, that works correctly right they, sharing them without having a proper prop process right is not uh, very much uh, which is established right now and achieving production grade latency right the way we say in the software industry that uh, like the release frequency when we build a software deploy it test it and release it into the production right that cycle reduces right similarly in ml right uh, this this is pretty hard, hard to achieve at the moment so these are the some of the challenges in ml engineering at the moment and that's what uh, ml ops is going to cater like put a process to like solve this problem i'll pause for a moment if there are any other questions or any any addition to these challenges right if you have 
right so uh, so so everything that we saw in the previous two slides uh, we are saying that uh, through the right use of ml ops we are able to address that is that what we are saying yeah at least we'll be able to answer those questions uh, and we'll be able to understand the problems that we have while uh, setting the processes using ml ops okay i have a, a another general question i mean you, you spoke about i think it was 13 or 18 on the last side percent of, of organizations are going in, in that direction at the moment. Do you think, yeah, the 13% rolled out. Do you think with the speed that how things are going and the fact that you've got the likes of your Googles and Microsofts and everything embracing it all fully and they've got the capacity and capability to, to keep up with this and drive it all, do you think that companies will be less inclined to want companies like us to to build this into their systems, or do you think we'll be leveraging what gets built by somebody else more and more, um, and so they'll just be components and and they'll take care of with a lot of these challenges, and it'll just be an element to the development versus actually part of the development. Yeah, that, that is a very good question, right? So I think that will depend on the, like we will have to choose between the trade-offs, right? For example, uh, if we are a company helping some product company and they have a great amount of research done already and they have a data science team, the only thing I think the big players are going to do here is going to put out the platforms to enable us to build the technology on the top of what they are releasing, right? For example, we will talk about the chat GPT, right? So they have put a model for billion of people right to like train and like enhance their models right but they have also enabled businesses right so that they can build this on the top of the technology that they have created like open ai they have created generative uh, AI, right so people businesses will be able to build on the top of that technology so that will be complementing each other in terms of that and, and yeah, this is what sort of answer I, I'm like trying to make, like a point mm. trying to make here, right? That this will be complementary. And in, in terms of innovation, certainly big players are having a good uh, amount of uh, advantage, right? Or edge on this, right? That they have innovated and they have money to invert. Like in this, in this slide, right? In presentation, I have also put uh, those points, like, points where you will see that what are the factors where people will be less inclined to invest in something which is their not cup, their cup of tea. Mm. Okay. Mm. So I hope this uh, answer of questions. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Thanks for asking the question. So let us move on. To what is MLOps, right? So this is also machine learning operation is a set of core activities, machine learning engineering. So initially we talk about machine learning engineering and different challenges. So MLOps is trying to put a process, right? To make a reusable pipeline to explore and build and test and deploy, serve and monitor machine learning models. So there are multiple terms here, right? Uh, that resembles to the software development like this cycle, right? When we create software, right? We start with creating the code and then the build and the test, deploy, serve, and in the observability. So this is what resembling, but the nature uh, where the ML engineering uh, is different from the software engineering is that uh, software engineering, which is like well-defined like as of now, right? Uh, it is well-established and we have uh, decades of experience using this, right? While ML is still uh, like, we, like we talked, right? Is very experimenting in nature. So things needs to be explored, right? Different people needs to be engaged to know the particular set of uh, processes and define that, right? So MLOps as compared to DevOps, as is ML is more complex than software development, but things are not very much as standard as STLC. Uh, continuing on this, so this support development and deployment in the way that DevOps and DataOps support application engineering and data engineering team does. The difference is that when, when you deploy a web service, you care about resilience, right? They, how, how fast they can just respond and like, uh, resume from their errors, right? Queries per second, 
load balancing and so on. When you deploy an ML model, you have uh, other numerous different problems, right? If you have to worry about the change in the data, right? So what if you have trained on some else data, right? And in prediction, in real time, you are getting something else, right? And accuracy of the prediction is going way below uh, than what a normal software would do, right? When it's developed and deployed, right? So ML software very much experimenting in nature, exploratory in nature, and needs a different set of processes. Uh, one, one question, Manish. Uh, if you go back to your previous slide, so that uh, the second, uh, the top second block, uh, on, sorry, the block on the right, so that says like aim to put a process to make a reusable pipeline. So does this reusable pipeline also corresponds to reproducibility of the pipeline? Or yes, yes. It can be. Yeah, I mean, it it certainly does. So when you will dig in into the detail process, right, you'll see that uh, we see this pipeline as a code, reusable code, where you can mm -hmm. cache the models, right, reusable the pipeline code, share the features that has been created, right? So this pipeline, uh, we'll also see in the demo that uh, like a similar pipeline uh, in Vertex AI that resembles this. Okay, like reproducibility in the sense like it's also a challenge like I see in the ML models where we cannot keep the state of a machine to a specific, uh, in a specific state. Uh, uh, so for example, I have a particular machine learning model. So I want to keep a snapshot of its state and I want to ex reproduce my, ex uh, my test data or some of the experiment with the same set of results, right? Again and again. So that becomes a little bit challenging in the machine learning world. Uh, so I thought like that that this like ML ML ops would capture this issue. Okay, yeah, thanks to bring this point right, Yush. So I think uh, the problem to that uh, specific extent, right? Will uh, like what ML ops is trying to convey, right? Is that have your process of your own, right? In whatever sense, choosing the right tool and technology, right? That is uh, something agnostic to the process, right? So maybe you can have some cache for the particular state of the model if possible and reuse if that uh, giving uh, you That's an easy. advantage, right? Otherwise, like, or saving your compute hours, right? So th this is what uh, MLOps is not uh, particular into. But okay. certain the strategies where you can reuse, like this, this governs on the high level, right? that what you can do to cache the models where, where they can be reused right and where exactly it has to be reused okay so you're saying like uh, caching is the key term uh, where this reusability and the reproducibility may lies in right yeah and i believe and i believe we are talking about caching the models we are not talking about uh, particularly data here that you know like uh, you get the same data inputs and that is what you're expecting as well so it's uh, it's the models and the reusable model deployment pipeline that we're talking about as a part of MLOps. Yes, yes. So we are same same thing like we do uh, something uh, with a particular software version, right? And put into the container registry, like as an image. So that kind of caching uh, I was talking about. Okay. Anyway, thanks for uh, bringing that point, right? So that it makes clear what it is and what it is not, right? So, uh, any other questions on this slide? All right. So, that's why uh, I was on a high level, right? I wanted to put an example here that how a machine learning uh, problem looks like, right? And what goes behind solving that problem on a high level, right? So in this example, right, uh, this diagram I have included uh, for a use case, right, where we want to predict the sales for a store for a particular date range. So for example, you see that uh, there are sales records and we have facts uh, over time that we know that uh, on this date, what was the sales record, right? And mm -hmm. what were the different factors, right? So uh, in this example, the first step is like data sourcing and injection. Like so, while we are trying to answer this question that for a particular date range, what would be the sales for a particular day, right? Uh, this what all goes in the ML engineering, right? Uh, from the beginning to end. 
and somehow it re resembles right with the pipeline that i talked about so we have a data source where, where we are not sure that this uh, like we are somewhat sure that this data has facts right but it is not exactly in the shape that can be used for ml right so as part of the data analysis in the second right the here the collaboration happens with the data science team who are subject matter experts who are working very closely with the business and they know that what can exactly be used to uh, train the model right what data is relevant what is not relevant right for example a particular product description might not be very much relevant but especially the category or product code might be so that can also like uh, only be known when you are particularly subject matter expert right so that goes into data analysis and when you know look into the data that these can be done you come to the data transformation and preparation phase where you are uh, talking about creating features right so feature is all like all the data which makes sense to use for uh, creating the labels right uh, so that to teach the machine and the model that this is what makes sense and when this comes you have to bring this output so you have to learn on a particular data set and then when that goes like uh, you have a model as an output right you you build the model using those labels and uh, you have a map like a model there right which tells that you simply give an input data that this is just sunday right and this is not a holiday and this is a particular date what will be the output and that uh, model will tell you that yes this is the output on the test data so uh, in ml ops right what the model goes into validation first right uh, maybe some manual testing or some checking the accuracy of the model right that it works correctly or not as per the training and then when everything is verified just like we have software verification right in different environment like staging and test like the very close to production we have staging right so in staging we know that the smoke test was perfect uh, we go to serve that model so we serve that model and we put it to prod on the real data and we see that for particular date in march right this will be the sales record and after that we keep on monitoring on the models that how it is performing uh, the parameters might be the accuracy of the model uh, how accurately it is predicting and efficiency how fast it is giving the result and any many other uh, uh, like matrices that we can get so this is what uh, uh, ml problem and solution will look like and will go behind the scenes these processes right on the high level any any questions on this I think uh, this is fine. So this is what you're saying. This is how the ML process works now from an ML ops perspective. Uh, how does it uh, how does it become better is where I'm trying to get to. Yeah, yeah. So uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Vika. So talking about the benefits, right? Uh, when a pipeline is automated, uh, we all know that development cycle reduces and time to market is shorter, right? So you can go fast when you have everything in pipeline right and collaboration happens quick right? and you can you are quickly able to train that model and deploy it to pipe like in the serve, serve the model and there's a better team collaboration so we are already talked about the team how the ml engineering team looks like so in this uh, when we have achieved that certain degree of process and automation we'll have better team collaboration and like efficiency and in terms of scalability, it will increase in, in the sense that uh, also like scalability here means uh, different terms, right? Uh, when we come like talk about the computing, right? And things scalability means that how you can uh, like respond to the different loads, right? Uh, here also in scalability means that uh, performance improvement in terms of reusability, less compute hours and increase on return on investment. And I mean, you can get from uh, loss to profitability or achieving your goal. Not exactly the scalability that computers. So that will come into picture when you have a platform and we are talking about, for example, Vertex AI, right? So that uh, gives you power to scale it. 
because it runs under the underlying infrastructure, which is not bounded, right? And you can get uh, this platform to achieve the certain scalability. Okay, so let us uh, get into detail, like what ML ops lifecycle means to us. So like we, we have seen in the examples, this is the formal example I have extracted uh, from the white paper. So this first come the ML development, right? So developing a robust and reproducible model training process, that is the training and pipeline code. So this is what uh, we, we were talking about, uh, that what ML development phase of the ML lifecycle means, that you have a reproducible model, like in terms of code, if it requires, if there is no code, that, that is fine, but even that should be automated, right? And there should be a training pipeline code where you are trying to automate everything using code or like maybe the SDK, whatever you are using. So to, to put a pipeline so that you don't have to manually train, right? And you can also like uh, give this pipeline output to input as a second stage. Like the second stage is talk about is training operate, operationalization. So this is automating the process of packaging, testing and deploying the repeatable and reliable training pipelines. So again, there's training pipelines are, uh, if you detail more, uh, like they read from some source, right? And uh, get the features, create labels, and then give the output as uh, labels, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the models right into the artifactory so that packaging talks about like uh, when when you have created the labels and you have trained the models it should exist so that you can automatically put it to a container registry uh, like uh, artifact like we have software artifact in the registries the third part is continuous training so this this is executing the training pipeline repeatedly for changing data set and training data so now you have training pipeline set and you have code to train the model and you have everything set up as a pipeline you like we we have continuous deployment and uh, like integration term right in sdlc a similar term is like for training is to when you have integrated a data incoming data and feature building you simply uh, trigger it when there is like more data for example if i would uh, like, talk about the sales example that i took when we have a weekly sales fact updated right we would like to retrain so we can automate it so that uh, when we have more sales record right over the week we can retrain our model and like get the labels corrected or even if uh, when we are talking about the synthetic uh, labeling right when when we are deploying people or subject matter experts who knows that uh, this label might get better result right they would put the synthetic data or labels right and that will trigger the training uh, pipeline so this continuous training talks about that um so many from this continuous training i have one question uh, okay. and the question is with time the models start getting skewed and by skewed, I mean they start leaning towards one particular decision. For example, like I have 1 million past sales data, right? For 1 million sales transactions, that those happen. Uh, and all of them I have used for training and now they are leaning towards something which they say, okay, it's happening. Now, any more addition to data to that training won't change it, right? how we can get out of that skewness in continuous training. Okay, okay. So yeah, I'll try to answer that question. Maybe like a scientist, data scientist might be more closer to it. So I think in my opinion, right, the features were like not correct or maybe they are getting skewed after a certain limit. So data science team might intervene and try to reconsider the features we are building upon. Maybe we are not creating the correct attribute and we are holding upon an exact attribute, which is no longer a relevant thing on the prediction. So they 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 can get a feature again created, right? And get a labels on based on that features and like retrain the model. So that would be one solution to it. But uh, again, uh, 
the people who are in like hyperparameter tuning and like mathematics right they would uh, answer more correctly than me i guess no but i think that, uh, that uh, that so i'm just curious uh, himanchu when you said that uh, uh, so yes then there there can be skewness in the data uh, there can be skewness in our model on the basis of the data that on which it has been trained but if we train it on uh, additional data sets which are going to remove that skewness i think that is going to work right so why do you say no. that no uh, any model cannot do that i can give a real world example uh -huh. so let's take an example of a human brain yeah. uh, it's a learning machine right it learns yeah but for example if i grew up learning a particular language yeah. adopting new language will be tough for me right now if we say how many people in the world know two languages those might be very very large population but how many people learning have known know about four or more languages that's very less and that's because any learning any new thing is tough for any machine uh, and that's what skewness means like i would be skewed more towards my native language not you know other any other language no but that uh, does not say that if you are putting effort to train it it will not it will not learn it so i don't think uh, that yeah, that's that would that. consume more more resources oh yeah only which is, which is okay start. yeah no which is okay which is which is exactly what is going to happen so when we talk about ai we talk about we talk about the bias in ai that bias right. in ai is just being generated on the fact that since we are feeding in certain kind of data hence it is biased to give a certain kind of results and that is where uh, there is a movement towards reduce that bias in ai so i think uh, i don't think that uh, you know like the skewness cannot be removed absolutely it is uh, it is resource in intensive the training has to be better but the bias in ai has to be removed you know like otherwise uh, we get into those situations where you know, like people of color or black people they are the ones who are uh, blamed for certain crimes but that is how the data has been settled so, uh, my my point is that for example if we, what if we want to add that skewness for, for example uh, let me give another example uh, for pricing right i want to decide the price of a product yeah now i know that that there are some additional charges for an online product versus offline product right there are some additional charges now i want to price it higher right, right. and right. i also want to price it price it according to the geographic locations yeah, now yeah. that is a skewed skewness which is a good skewness Uh, what i was talking about how we can you know remove it in case we don't want it and how we can add it if we don't want it so it's it's kind of a dual engine uh, that i'm thinking about less of training and more of you know rule engine so uh, so you you sorry you, to be clear are you saying if there is a skewness that is introduced because of the data that's being used and we don't right. want that to affect the results how can we exclude it potentially right. and change right. that right so for example like uh, i i have seen cases which where the iphone users were seeing much higher price than the android users and that was being you know on basis on the data that uh, the model received yeah uh, which they no, on you know of cut updated yeah so, but again see underlying what you are also saying him also that underlying it is the data that is driving everything so mm -hmm. you 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 right. you throw in new data you are going to get skewed results this is what we talk to our clients as well that you know like everybody wants to do machine learning and ai but machine learning ai is that last you know like 12 to 15% of whatever you can do so first everything is data and that is where we need to you know like bring that in and i think with ml ops as well that is what we want to do that with ml ops you want to make sure that the model can be refreshed the model can be served better the pipeline exists for us to you know like feed in the right data sets and retrain the model so i think uh, all of that is uh, where uh, uh, we want to get to himanchu with regards to your skewness as well because yes the models have to this right now but all of that skewness is dependent upon the kind of data that we are feeding the models with so uh, the better we can do that and the uh, faster we can do that the more iterations that we can do i think the models will become better that is where right. i mean my question was more towards in the, like for skewness how business will handle it like from more from business perspective than more of your data science i know yeah. it's it's more of a science related part but yeah. uh, mine was more business related i yeah. another... so, sorry go ahead i, I just want to ask another quick question um in terms of the the algorithms that are used for the training 
um, and this might be one of the challenges here, how typically how robust are they to change? How often do they need to be updated? Obviously, it does depend in the beginning when you're first building them, there's, you know, constant change. But once they're in place, things are changing all the time. There's data going out there all the time. How robust are they and how often do they have does the training have to be changed or updated? Yeah, again, that, that question I would ask to the data science guy, who is very close to the business and understand the business that what matters and what not. And how like he have put the analysis in the data that affects the like result of the accuracy of the like model that has been trained earlier, right? So uh, it, it varies like a lot on the huge cases. For example, if you talk about the chat, GPT, right? It is very adaptive, right? When some rule-based engine that you have written and predicting for a particular business, like for example, biochemistry, I would say that pharmaceutical companies who are making decision on this, right? Any any subject matter expert will tell that uh, uh, this is not good, right? And this 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 even does not fit for a AI kind of application, right? Like in like that is relate like relate to the disaster right or little things so we should not be using but there are general things which has been uh, like already trained and a lot of data sets have been used right like for for example the chat bots and all right they will be able to adapt like in a conversational way and they will be able to like produce a result which which won't hurt right and like people might be using it for purpose. So, okay. so, so you are saying, Manish, like, again, uh, okay. I was saying, like, you are saying, Manish, that uh, so when the data model should change depends upon scenarios and business use case, right? But how difficult yeah. it would be to change it. So, does that answers? Uh, yeah, so that uh, that where ML ops is helping. Okay. That whenever you decide, when when you have an observation, right, in this life cycle, you are doing a continuous monitoring, right? The moment you see decline in the accuracy you pull up the guy who has like built and trained the model and when you say that dig into that and what is the problem yeah, I, don't agree. Yeah, I don't think that there's a straight answer to that you know it depends on the model it depends on how far it is away from the accuracy that you need and uh, then you just retrain it so uh, there is no one answer that can say that you know like you re retrain it every one week or 15 days so uh, it just depends yeah. on the use yeah. yes so MLOps can help answer that or debug that problem. That's certainly a very good problem, right? Which we are all trying to figure out, right? And everyone who is following ML that how, how robust it can be. So I hope I have answered uh, to some extent. So moving on. We yes, have thank you. Model deployment, right? Where packaging, testing, and deploying model to a serving environment. Right. Uh, so we, we now at the stage where we have trained the model and we are eager to see how we, it is resulting. Right. So we serve it to an environment so that like online experimentation can happen or you can simply test it with the test data and see how effectively it is being done. So this is the deployment. This goes uh, right to a packaging like container registry. And this prediction surveying is the model that you have done testing and experimentation and you are putting into the production for actual use. So that is one and continuous mean like monitoring, which we are already talked about, right, is the accuracy or the efficiency of the model you are continuously monitoring with the set. And when you see that there is a big gap, you are trying to alternate, uh, go alternate on the models or like uh, retrain the model, right? So that's what ML of life cycle is about. I think this is just a flattened version of that uh, end to end flow, like that uh, like little detail on the technology side. So when we said uh, that this ML development, right? This is more towards code and config and operate, operationalize the training part. And when training pipeline is there, you are continuously training with the data that you have in the this process data and model management. And then you register your model to some container registry that's called the model deployment to simply like uh, 
in SDLC, we have Docker images put to the container registry for tagged as a use, right? And then that goes to staging and you are serving that model and saying that uh, this is working effectively or not, or this has to go to some change. And then it, uh, when you serve it to actual use and you are continuously monitoring, so this cycle goes. So this is what uh, on the high level MLOps is trying to put process for. And there are certain like deeper guidelines, which was like I did not like, include in the introductory part of this uh, MLOps. So we have two more minutes. Uh, I'll, I'll move to the demo part. Which is also a very high level. So this this is Vertex AI, uh, a platform which supports uh, all of things we, we talked about, right? So uh, this uh, provides a platform to deploy and like run models, serve models, and this works on Kubeflow, which is backed by again the Kubernetes, right? And there are different, uh, like we'll start with features. So this project I'm using uh, my friends Jeff project uh, to demo, right? They have achieved a certain degree of automation in their project uh, to predict and like create feature and train the model and put the model into the registry and like create a pipeline for it and serve it and use it. So I'm- So can you, uh, can, you, can you give us some background? What is this model that we are trying to prepare? What is the kind of data set that we are working on? What are yeah. the features of that data? Sure, Vikas. So this is the sales example, the same okay. sales example where we are creating features, okay. which are the prepared data. And we are okay. trying to create features that which are the attributes we are going to use uh, to train the model with. So there okay. are features like locality type and product mix, store ID, date, like day of week, mm -hmm. holiday flag, promotion flag. These are the attributes we are choosing to make yeah. a production that how sales will be uh, there for a particular. Okay, day. so the end output that we are expecting is that we are making a prediction on the sales, is it? That yes, the uh, dollar value of the how, many, yeah. how many sales will be there for a particular day. And these are the entities. So entities are like uh, uh, two entities, store and store date entities, like date of week, date, and this holiday, all are like the, the Google, like here the Vertex AI tag them as a entity. So these all are attributes are related to store date entity, while the locality and product mix are related to the store entity. Okay. Now moving on, when we have this feature, uh, right? Let me go to the pipeline directly. Uh, can explain what it, this pipeline. This pipeline is coded in Python SDK, mm -hmm. and here we have features. When, when we detail this feature, this feature exists uh, somewhere on cloud storage, Google Cloud Storage, and this is a data proc job which is like just importing this feature and the, giving an output data set as a Google Cloud Storage again. And this part, uh, this condition part, just make sure that all the features are there, what we use to train the model. Mm -hmm. And here, uh, this also gives an output data like as a final feature. And then we take this feature as an input and like pushing to another data proc job where we are getting a label created. So what difference between a feature and a label is that feature is an input and label is an output. So for example, if you are saying that the day of, day of week is Sunday and Saturday, like sales will be high. Like it will be more than what the average day of week is, right? So the, the label we are creating is assisting the model to predict on the real data set. Mm -hmm. So this is also being saved as a data set, like on the Google Cloud Storage. And here you have another job to train that model. And finally, the model train, the output will be the trained model on the uh, container registry. Uh, sorry, not the container registry, the another output model, right? On the, uh, this is the model. And there, when you deploy this model, this will be the Google con container registry.io where you are putting your model to work. 
So, uh, so are we using a pre-made model from Google in order to put in this data and train that model, or what is the model? Yes, uh, yes, Vika. So we are using Auto ML, uh, which is a kind of a very high category, like already done kind of thing, but not very customizable or customizable or doing hyperparameter tuning, which you can customize a detail. But you can use AutoML. This feature provide, uh, provided by uh, this uh, Vertex AI, and you will get the model automatically. Given you don't have any data of type with the, uh, like which does not support it, it is AutoML, right? So again, I am saying that uh, Ram and Jeff has worked, put a good amount of work on there, right? Mm. And as I could understood that AutoML right require little intervention into that, like parameter tuning and all. So you simply get a model output out of the, this. And as part of the next process, you have these models here deployed. Uh, this is the sales arena model that I'm using, which is uh, source custom training on February 24th. And I have this model here and I have a sample start and end date range. Uh, which I'm like this when we go to deploy and test, right? This model is deployed and is active. And I'm, I'm trying to test my model, which is already there. It also gives you option to like give a sample request of how you will like uh, test your model with the input data. So this is the range state that I have put. And if I do predict, it will respond something like this for a particular range. So maybe the start range is 6th of January and this is what, oh, March, 6th March. So I think around 60 records, right, will be there for each date predicting the sales. Hmm. Okay. So uh, this was a little demo, what resembles the ML ops when we try to put as a part. No, but part there is a, so, so, so where is the ML ops in this? You know, like this is something that I'll create a model. I'll, uh, you know, like uh, train the model. I'll give it an, uh, an input and I expect an output. I think this is something that I would expect out of any model. But how are we doing that part of ML ops, which goes back to, you know, like uh, model deployment. You know, like uh, uh, retraining the model. I think that is the automation part, right? Yeah, yeah, that that is correct. So this example or demo, right, does not correctly uh, resembles all the steps, but there are uh, reusability is there when we go to pipeline. Uh, this this models, right, they are going to container registry, which again you can version, right. So we can we have deleted other versions. There were a lot of them, right, mm -hmm. and you can switch back and forth on different models. And again, when you are seeing this tick, right, like here. If you highlight on this, uh, this will give you that skipped, being skipped and being used from the cache. Let me highlight one over on this. So the button when you are seeing it, mm -hmm. skip because this step was reused from the cache. So there are certain steps in the pipeline which are using from the container registry or the cache where features are already there and you are not uh, building much features. So the ability to version the features is gives ability to share the features across teams, right? And version them and uh, do the training part only for the data which is arrived later. So these, these part of the automations which Vertex AI supports, but uh, I have uh, not gone to that extent where uh, each steps I can assemble on the uh, uh, Vertex AI, which uh, we, we talked about the ML ops. So, MLOps is like more mature kind of thing, which requires a, a greater discipline to implement everything around it. Mm, but what about things like uh, monitoring, as you said, and validation? How do we, how do we do those? Okay. And how yeah. So take monitoring, uh, I, I have seen this. Uh, when we when we go to a particular model right here. This itself gave, I try to explore much on this project. So deploy and test, no, this is not wrong. Somewhere I, I could see all the stats for a particular training set. One second, no, this is not the training. Like for features, right? Uh, I could see, 
I believe it's on the endpoint. Yeah, yeah. Let me, uh, Yeah, these are the states that uh, are coming, but not not exactly here for some reason because maybe the, it is stale. But here we can see the, the stats. No records. So okay, uh, maybe, maybe yeah, we'll 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 see that. But but where I'm getting confused is the following. So all of these stats and all these monitoring and everything. Through MLOps, I'm not supposed to do that manually, right? You know, like I can go and check these out on my own as a manual activity, but that is not the intent here. Through MLOps, don't we want to automate all of this? Uh, so when I'm getting confused is that, uh, you know, like in this entire demo, I don't know where MLOps is, uh, or, or maybe I'm, I haven't understood the concept well enough. No, you are correct, Vikas. So this demo, I was just the purpose to look around the demo is to just to resemble the part of parts of it, like registry and the caching and reusing. But this mm -hmm. demo, I have not prepared entirely uh, to see that we are implementing MLOps, right? So I'll be honest here that that does okay, not. Okay, but 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 what we are saying is that Vertex AI gives us the capability of implementing uh, automated MLOps. Uh, so that uh, so that we can keep working on models, refining the models, deploying, and so on and so forth. Is it? Yes, yes, I would certainly so say so because of the registry and the scaling uh, platform that it provides. Uh, it, it 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 provides all those sort of facilities where you can implement using the MLOps processes that we were talking about. Okay, scaling part. Okay, I can understand. Yeah, scaling is something that it will provide, and probably that is a part of. Yeah, scaling the machine learning model. Uh, okay, okay. But are you saying that uh, on the basis of uh, certain validations and monitoring that we are doing, uh, we might be able to improve the model as well on the basis of the... Um, so so what I'm trying to go is that just like we do CI-CD pipelines, most of that is automated. Uh, how much of this can be automated so that I am I as a model developer, I'm not worried about that. What I'm worried about is that, oh yeah, you know, like if I'm seeing certain thresholds being uh, uh, breached, then in that case, uh, you know, like it gives me a trigger to add more training data or things like that. So uh, that is where I'm coming from. I'm just trying to draw parallels yeah. with the CD pipelines. Yeah, so like I think I, we are now talking about the Vertex more, right? Uh, doing MLOps using Vertex through automated CI CD. Like or in general, you know, like, uh, so uh, MLOps, are we talking about alerting, for example? Uh, do we yeah. do we do we get uh, alerts uh, out of our MLOps pipeline just like we get it through our CI/CD pipelines? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, uh, it, it is monitoring. So uh, the umbrella term is monitoring, right? Mm -hmm. So okay. even you can set pager duty for a particular trigger, right? So mm -hmm. that that is the particular thing that MLOps is not talking about because that that is the huge case that what extent of uh, monitoring is required for a particular model. So maybe some models work perfectly and we do not need. But some yeah. for high performing models, right? We need alerts per hour, like for some Easter sale is going or some, something like that. So we need yeah. more alerting on that. So yeah, th mm -hmm. that it uh, tells about. So I think Vertex AI certainly, like Google has a lot of capabilities on this, like alerting. Uh, similarly, Amazon CloudWatch and everything, right? Or you, you can set alerts. So that is more of an engineering part of it, right? Which you can do. Okay. All right, uh, so getting back to the slides, I think that is what I had. I think I wanted to end it with a joke that we had, we had on the chat GPT, right? Mm -hmm. So you can get the joke, right? Uh, people are trying to trick chat GPT about the human emotions, right? And on the right side, I was trying to get this answer why chat GPT is so not updated and so old updated because it is very latest technology. Uh -huh. And day before yesterday, I was like going through a report, right? That was saying that these, these are like costing millions of dollars to, to train the models like these, which are using by like many of people, right? Yeah. So yeah, this is uh, not a very like, 
relevant to the topic right but this like yeah this is one of the sites where we also have to think about right when we automate things right and think upon the large models like chili was asking earlier right and how robust they are so yeah. things like these technologies right they are pretty robust and people are using for fun but uh, the actual business cases right they you 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 have to update it right when when it requires I use the same thing. This was an old joke from the Reddit I took, right? Yeah. So you, yeah. I tested the same thing today, and it was the different answer that uh, sometimes the human relations are uh, that you 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 accept that your wife is correct, but uh, so it was some something that guided me that yeah. uh, okay to like correct your wife. So I <laughs> thought that now it has been updated, right? Yeah, yeah, even yeah, also, yeah. Even if this is costing more, much much more money, right? Uh, yeah. There's a billion of investments. Uh, uh, if we open this report, we'll see that yeah. how people are investing in open AI, like 10 billions from Microsoft and many more. Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah, I think the answer is still in career because it is, it is never okay to correct your wife, but that's okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Yeah. So. All right. Uh, Thank you uh, all for the good questions. Right? And, Talking on the top. Right. Thank you, Anish. And everybody Thank have you, a everyone. lovely weekend that we meet. Thank next you. Week. Thank you, Anish. Yeah. Thanks, Anish. Okay. Thanks, Anish. Bye bye.